Someone say, we're going to war. We're going to have three days of war, four days of war. Because we're, see, God, God, we don't go to war to go to war. We go to war to expand, to come on. We go to war to gain territory. We go to war, come on, to help some people. We go to war to take over what the enemy has had. We're saying, devil, you can't have my family anymore. You can't have my city anymore. You can't have, come on, you can't have my mind anymore. I'm going to war. And I'm going to ask you, come tomorrow. Because I want to hear every word that God has for us. And we put the speakers in God's hands. And you know what that means? They're going to speak what they're supposed to speak. You guys understand that? We're in a transition to do worldwide ministry, disciple people like we've never discipled them. There will be warfare. But in warfare, there's casualties. And I don't want you to become a casualty of war. So you mean, Pastor, I'm going to die? No, you're going to spiritually die. Before you know it, you have no desire to worship God, praise God, or even be in the house of God. All this stuff is going to be an option to you. The presence of God is not an option. In him I move and breathe. I find my existence in his presence. I need God in my life. I need fellowship. I need brothers and sisters. It's the same if I watch it on TV. No, it's not. Because when you're watching on TV, you're baking, you're, you're um, turning over eggs too. Honey, what do you want? You want some coffee with that? Uh, cream and sugar? What did he say? I don't even know what he says. We'll get to it. Maybe we'll rewind it if we have time. Where we're going after breakfast. <laughs> and you know what's happened? You're a soldier that's AWOL. You're not in position. So there's no growth, there's no impact. And this is the reason you love your comfort more than you love the presence of God. I'm trying to help somebody here. I'm telling you, God told me this. There's going to be a miracle return of God's presence. Come on in the church. So we're going to just cover for a few minutes. David. David is, I'm talking about the same David that killed Goliath, that guy. And one of his titles was a man after God's own heart. He was a what? He desired God and his will over everything. David had a relationship with God. David was successful. So I want to just go over a little bit of David's success, and then I want to cover the cause of his success. He had success, but what was the cause of his success? But let's define, let's look at his success first. In 2 Samuel, we read verse 5, chapter 5 says, Then all the tribes of Israel went to David at Hebron and told him, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, when Saul was our king, you were the one who really led the forces of Israel. And the Lord told you, you would be the shepherd of my people Israel, you will be Israel's leader. So this scripture is saying that David was anointed or chosen to be a king. Some will say promotion and success. Out of all the people on the earth, God chose David to lead his people. He chose him as the leader and the king of his people. So the first thing we see in David's resume is that he was promoted and chosen to be a king of a nation. And the one that chose him wasn't the people, the one that chose him was God. And once God chooses you, there's no one that could unchoose you. No one has to vote a calling on you. God's already called you, you have a purpose. It's up to you to accept the calling. David had to accept the calling. But when God calls you, he equips you to do it. So David is now king, and the people are for him as well, because while Saul was king, the king before him, that he wasn't a man after God's own heart, David was already getting in position 
by fighting and leading the Israelites into war. So David had success. He was a king. The second thing we see about David, David is victorious in battle. Someone say victorious in battle. David is so victorious in battle, he's undefeated in battle. That means he has perpetual victory. Say it with me. Perpetual victory. That means whatever battle he was in, he won. So that's why he wasn't intimidated by the circumstance. He was intimidated by the size of the enemy. He wasn't intimidated by the words because he already had perpetual victory. He couldn't, you couldn't go back into his resume and see a loss because David never lost. If David was leading the battle, it was guaranteed victory. So let's look at this. David becomes king. And you know what the first thing he does? He goes to war. He goes to war to expand his kingdom. Anytime there's going to be expansion, there will be a war. There will be resistance. There's things that the enemy has had a hold of in your life and in your family. And he doesn't want to let it go. So this means you're going to have to go to war. Let my children go. Let my marriage go. Let my mind go. Let my body go. Someone say fight. We were created to go to war for people. War for souls. We were created to fight against the enemy. We were created to evict him out of territory that he holds. You're no longer going to hold Pomona. You're not going to hold the whole TJ anymore. We're coming, and we're coming to go to war. Let's look at this. So now in verse 6 it says, 2 Samuel verse five, chapter 5, verse 6, then David then led his men to Jerusalem to fight against the Jubus, Jubusites or Jebusites, whoever they are. <laughs> the original inhabitants of the land who were living there. So these people were holding Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the headquarters or the capital of Israel. But there was somebody that was holding, these Jebusites were holding territory that belonged to Israel. There's some things that belong to you, but you just allowed the enemy to hold it down. And he's saying, why don't you fight for it? Why are you letting it happen? Didn't I equip you my spirit to go to war? And if you go to war, I'll help you win. Well, they've been living, it's just been like that for so long. I don't even know if I should fight for it anymore. Let's just see what happens. The Jebusites taunted David saying, you'll never get in here. So the first thing the devil will tell you when you go to war, it won't work. And do you know for some people, that's where the battle ends? They act like God said it. It wasn't like God said it, the enemy said it. Your past said it. Your mother that abused you said it. It wasn't that God said it. Circumstance said it. And just because there's a no in the atmosphere doesn't mean there couldn't be a yes inside of you. Even the blind, look, look, this is what the Jebusites are saying. He goes, imagine this. And when you go to war, you got to overcome imaginations of you failing and you're not succeeding and you're not overcoming and there's not change. It's always going to remain the same. I'll always be addicted. I'll always be depressed. I'll always lose. I'll always be in poverty. It'll never work out. I'll get kicked out of this church too. And then when you come with those mindset, you're defeated not by the circumstance. You're defeated by what you're meditating on. Even the blind and the lame could keep you out. What they're saying is, we're so secure, we're so not intimidated by you, David, that even if right now I'm going to send the blind people in our city and the lame people, and they'll even keep you out. That's how weak you are. Stop trying to get confirmation from the devil about your purpose. 
Stop trying to get confirmation from people that don't even know God for your purpose. Stop trying to get confirmation from society about who you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to do. Some of us have been drunk with, come on, drunk with the messages of the world. We say drunk, what does that mean? You're under the influence of world think, worldly thinking. And when you're drunk, you can't operate your life right. Some of you guys need to turn off all social media and just turn on the Bible. You need to go to bed with your Bible. You, instead of, you need to put on some earphones and just put the Bible on and just fall asleep hearing the word because you overdosed on the world already. For the Jebusites thought they were safe. They thought they were safe. There's some spirits that right now think they're safe because they haven't had resistance for years. They have a false sense of security. But wake up. I said, Pastor, aren't you scared to call out demons? No, I'm not care, scared to call out demons. And I'll tell you why. Because they've done enough, enough harm in my life, enough harm in this city, enough harm in your life for someone from finally to say, enough is enough. We are coming to take back what's ours. Give it back. They thought they were safe. You know why the demons think they're safe? Because they've heard all this rhetoric before. Psst. These demons are saying, Psst. I don't care about today. Let them get through this service. When they get in the parking lot, I already got them. I got them, we're good. They're like robots for me. I don't even mind them going to church because there's never any change anyways. Let them go to church. They don't disciple nobody. They don't praise God. They don't worship God. They have no private time with God. They don't go to discipleship classes. They don't disciple nobody. Good. Leave them there. I, don't, I already got them on cruise control. We're safe, demons. I wonder if there's meetings in hell that it, our demons are saying we're safe. And God is saying you're not safe. Because I'm raising up a group of people that realize that they need my presence, they need my power, and they're coming. There's going to be a miracle return of my dependence on my power again. Okay. Someone said David was victorious in battle. David doesn't let the words and images of the enemy defeat him. He don't let the images and words defeat him. Stop meditating on crazy stuff. The spirit of suicide comes, you rebuke it, you don't talk to it. You should kill yourself. Really? How? Can you give me some options how I could do it? I said, Pastor, are you crazy people think that way? Yes, we think that way. Because your emotions want you to entertain it. And you gotta, you gotta say, no, I'm not gonna entertain this. I'm gonna fight this thing. And I'm not gonna be influenced by the words and images of the enemy. I'm gonna get a word from God. I'm gonna live and I won't die. And I will declare the goodness of God everywhere I go. I'm going to war. Okay. The other thing David was, talking about his success. David became more and more powerful and prosperous as he went. So not only was David victorious and he was king, but there was an ascent. He was climbing and climbing, not a decline, he was climbing. The scripture says in, in um, 2 Samuel 5, 10 says, and David became more and more powerful because the Lord of heaven's armies was with him. This is what God is saying. Your most powerful days aren't behind you. Your most powerful days and effective days are ahead of you. Come on, give God some praise. Come on. And, come on. And, and she became, and David became more powerful. Come on. And Chris became more and more powerful. And Sandra became more and more powerful. And Robert became more and more powerful. And John became more and more powerful. Every day he was living, he became more and more powerful and more effective. There's going to be a fight against that thought. But this is what I know. 
I'm going to be more powerful in my future than I ever was. Well, pastor, you know you're getting older. We've seen those pictures. I thank God that my anointing has nothing to do with my age, has nothing to do with my knees. It has to do with my relationship with God. Right now, I got some experience. I got some great coming in. But right now, I'm going into my prime. I'm going to become more and more powerful. And when I die, I'm going to die in my most powerful state. How many are ready to go that way? Aren't you glad you're part of something bigger than you? So David became more and more powerful and more and more prosperous. And then the other last thing about his success, and I want to get into what causes success, but the other thing about his success is that no weapon formed against him was prospering. He had anointing, called by God. He was perpetually winning every fight. He became more and more powerful and prosperous. And then no weapon formed against him prospered. So it didn't matter who was coming against him. David already know. It's that it doesn't matter what's coming against me. It's what's for me that matters. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, look at this. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king of Israel, they mobilized all their forces to capture him. As soon as the surrounding enemies found out that he was anointed, he was called, and he accepted it, the enemy, the Philistines, came in and they said, we're going to mobilize all our forces against him, and this is our goal, to capture him. All I'm saying is be aware that you don't become a prisoner of war. Be careful that you don't get captured in your private time. Because as soon as you accept a call on your life to live for God and change the world, the enemy is going to mobilize tactics to trap you and capture you. He'll get you offended. What happened? Why would you leave the church? Because an usher told me not to sit there. So the devil used an usher. And the devil ushered you outside the church. You know what happened? You just got captured. And then you know what your story is now? That church is rude. And that's why you don't serve God. And that's why you're out of church. And that's why your life's full of demons. And that's why your family's falling apart. Because the usher was rude. All I'm saying, can you get taken out that easy? That just one rude person can capture you? One person? And that becomes your story for the rest of your life? All I'm saying, be careful because you could get captured by an addiction. You could get captured by a distraction. You could get captured by a, a hobby. You could get captured by your career. You could get captured, come on, by a cute guy, a cute girl. You could get captured by a conversation. You could get captured by some gossip. You could get captured by your past. You could get captured by the fear of your future. You could get captured by your worry. You got to be careful. You could get captured by greed. You could be captured by money. Just be careful. You don't get captured. Captured and you get and you, and your anointing and your purpose gets captured. They want to capture him, but it doesn't matter. No weapon formed against me is going to prosper, dummies. I spend enough time in the presence of God to see a fiery dart when it's coming. I spend enough time with the power of God to hear what you're trying to do. I already know what you're trying to do. And it's not going to work here. It's not going to work with me. And it's not going to work with the way world outreach. Devil, no weapon formed against us. Okay. Praise the Lord. Come on, are we at war? Come on. Look at this. When the, Philistines, when the Philistines heard that David was anointed to be king of Israel, they mobilized all their forces to capture him. But 
David was told they were coming. You can't do, you can't trick me no more. I see you coming from far now. You used to be able to get me with that easy stuff. Now I got some revelation. I got some insight. I got a little wisdom underneath my belt. I've been coming to church for two months. Two months ago, you would have got me with that stupid little lie. Two months ago, you could have called me at 12 o'clock midnight and tell me to come over to your house, but not no more. I'm sleeping or I'm praying, but I ain't going over to your house. You're not going to take advantage of me. I'm not your little lust, lust little tool play, you player. See, but when you start getting some revelation from God and you start getting some insight and you start getting some conviction, all that stuff seems silly. Do you think I'm going to hang out with you, throw away my power, throw away my anointing, throw away my call, my dignity, my honor, my family, my kids? For you, you don't even have a J-O-B. I don't even see you interesting anymore. As a matter of fact, I feel like throwing up when you offer me stuff now. Because what I you see, I start hating what God hates. I don't like that anymore. I don't like the sin anymore. I'm seeing it now. But David was told they were coming, so he went into a stronghold. He went into his place that strengthened him. I, I'm going to ask you this. Do you have an area, a stronghold? That means a place where, you, where you're protected. It's, it, you're, you have a place, a prayer place, a time with God where you go. When all hell's breaking loose, you just go into your bunker with the Lord just to hear him. And in that place, you're safe. See, and if you don't have a stronghold and you don't have a place of prayer, and sometimes the church is your stronghold, sometimes the word is your stronghold, sometimes prayer is your stronghold, sometimes you're all by yourself and you go read a book, and a Christian book, and that's your stronghold. But you got to know, don't go to the world for your escape. Go to God in the middle of your trials. So now, so now David, we're verse now 19. So David... These Philistines are coming to capture him. And these guys are bad warriors. They have some giants in their land. David killed one of those Philistines in the beginning of his career, Goliath. And these guys have been ruling the atmosphere. But the only problem now, the king that's in place is different than the king that was earlier in place. King Saul was in place and he was not a man after God's own heart. So Saul was killed. Now David comes in. They think they're picking a fight with the same Israel. It's a different Israel because they have a different leader. It's not the same old family because you're not the same old man. I'm not the same woman. Something's happened in my life. Those who used to be able to take me out pretty easy, but not no more. I know God in a way I've never known God. So you could come with those same battles, but this time it's not going to work. Say it with me, it's not going to work. Praise the Lord. So now. David asked the Lord. David what? You know what David does? He uses his number one weapon of war. How is he undefeated? He uses his number one weapon of war. His number one weapon of war is prayer. He talks to God. And let's see what the conversation is. David is not freaked out. He knows he has God. And I love the confidence that David has, he not only is asking God something, he's expecting an answer. That's the kind of relationship he has. So David asked the Lord, should I go out to fight the Philistines? You tell me. Will you hand them over to me? 
I just want to know. Because if you say no, I ain't going to go. Because without you, I got no victory. Because it, I know this is because the Lord God of heaven's armies is with me. That's the only way I win. And you know what, what this is all about? We're, doing too, we're making too many decisions without any inspiration from God. And then when it doesn't work out, God, where are you? And God is saying, you never talked to me about that. You just do stuff. And I love this. Someone said, then the Lord replied to David. And he says, yes, go. I will certainly hand them over to you. So David went to Baal Perazim and defeated the Philistines there. And then David said this, the Lord did it, David explained. He burst through my enemies like a raging flood. You know what's so awesome? David gets victory, and you know what he does? He gives God the credit. He goes, the Lord did it. And God says, go ahead, fight that battle. You know what God has told us? Go ahead and take TJ. Go ahead and take Pomona. Go ahead and, come on, go ahead and take Kenya. Go ahead and start that church. I'm with you. And certainly you will have victory. Come on, let's get a go ahead from God. Lord, should I, should I go out with him? He cute. And he has a nice car. This is the problem. We don't ask that. I'm not even going to ask God because he might say no. <laughs> I don't want his opinion about this. I, I could see that he's cute. Okay. Right? Then we wonder why things don't work out. Okay, now, I'm going to end it with this. I just want to hit this. I thank God we're in summertime. And movies are now two hours long, some of them. So you could be here for another 10 minutes and get the download of God. Someone said the cause of his victory. Say with me, the cause of his victory. So he was successful. No weapon formed against him will prosper. He prayed, God answered. He had perpetual victory. He was king. He was promoted. He became more and more powerful. Every year, every day, he was increasing in power. He was increasing in influence. He was increasing in anointing. He was increasing in prosperity. What caused this thing? Because I want to let you know something. David was not born again. Well, what do you mean David wasn't born again? They, Jesus didn't die for his sins yet, so David could not be born again. All I'm saying is this was pre-Jesus. And before Jesus, if someone could walk in that power, how much more power can someone after Jesus, post-Jesus can walk in? Come on, give God some praise. The pages shift is turning. And we're going to end it with this. So now, David defeats the Philistines. He defeats the Jubicites. He defeats everybody that comes to mess with him. He's gaining territory. He's becoming more powerful. He's now king, and now he's taking action as king. And this is what David does. This is his most important thing he does as king right here. Then David again gathered all the elite troops in Israel. 30,000 in all. Right now you're thinking, man, he's getting his best warriors now. He's ready to really go to war now. So what is he going to do with these 30,000 elite warriors or troops? Give me the best warriors you got. Because this assignment is the most important assignment I'll ever carry out as a king. Because this is why I succeed. This is why I win. This is why I'm becoming more powerful. This is why no weapon formed against me will prosper. This is why. This assignment. So he led them, this army, to Bala, 
of Judah to bring back the ark of God, which bears the name of the Lord, the, heaven, the Lord of heaven's armies, who is enthroned between the cherubim. Now, he said, Pastor, explain that to me. The ark, the ark of the covenant, say with me, the ark of the covenant. Say with me again, the ark of the covenant. Represents the presence of God. Say with me, the ark of the covenant represents the presence of God. Now what the Ark of the Covenant was, was a chest or a box, which was right around three feet, three feet, nine inches wide, and around two feet, three inches high. And if you opened it up, you'd find three things in there. You'd find the tablets that Moses got from Mount Sinai God wrote out the tablets that were in there. You'd also find a jar of manna, which meant the provision of God in the wilderness. That's what they ate. They'd get food from heaven, and it was there to remind them of God being a provider. And then they, there was another thing in there, which was, was Aaron's rod. And Aaron's rod was very unique. It was a rod. What's a rod? It's a, it's a walking stick. It's a staff. But then it budded. It was alive somehow. It was a miracle. It was just to prove that God was with them and he called them and anointed them to lead. But what this, rep, this, this box, if the church was, is, was, was like it was in those days, they would have an outdoor courtyard and then they would have a place called the Holies and then they'd have the place called the Holies of holies. Now, the holies of holies was where the presence of God resided. So there would be like a curtain, and in this place, the Ark of the Covenant was sitting there, and no one could go in there without permission or worthy, or they'd be killed in the presence of God. So it represented the presence of God. Now, this is what happened. After many wars, everything was destroyed. And the Philistines in one battle took the Ark of the Covenant. They thought they could capture the power of the Israelites. So what they did was they go, we got the Ark of the Covenant. We stripped them of their power because their power is in the presence of God. Because we know without God, they can't fight. They're just a whole bunch of slaves. They're a whole bunch of nobodies. But with God, we can't fight them. So they got this, this ark, and this was the problem. When they took it into their city, they were trying to capture God. And this is what happened. A curse came upon the city, and everybody started getting fatal tumors. So the leadership got together and said, we think the reason we're getting all these tumors and all these rats, all, it was tumors and rats. Just the rats alone, I wouldn't like. The tumors and the rats just pretty bad. So the, the leaders got together and they said, hey, let's go ahead and get rid. Let's send it to another city. So they send it to another city and those people got rats and tumors too. Now everybody's dying. Everybody's getting cancer. So this city says, send it to another city. And they send it to another city. Now they get tumors and they get rats. Finally, someone gets to their senses and they said, let's send it back to Israel. <laughs> so they send it back to Israel, but this is a problem. Israel no longer values the presence of God. They've settled in their defeated lifestyle. They've settled in their, come on, they've settled in their addiction. They've settled in their failure. They've settled in their depression. They've settled in this whole hum life with no power. Now the churches have no power and they're okay with it. And the reason being is the churches are full, but full of a whole bunch of dead, weak Christians with no ark. So what ended up happening, this ark ends up in somebody's house.
It used to be in the holies of holies. Now it's in somebody's house as a piece of furniture. You know how long it stays there? 70 years. Saul becomes king and he doesn't value the presence of God. So he doesn't try to get the ark back into the middle of the city. He's okay on his own strength. He's okay with his army. I got this on my own. So David becomes king and he says, you know why I succeed? It's the ark. It's the presence of God. And if we're going to be a successful nation, if we're going to be a successful people, if we're going to be a successful church, if we're going to be a successful Christian, we need the presence of God back in the center of our church and our lives. So David fights to get the presence back, the power back, the glory back, the cause of his success. So he finds it in that guy's house and they bring it back. They start to process to bring, they start to process to bring it back. David is now celebrating, but there's something that they do wrong. I'm gonna end it right now, but there's something they do wrong. Are you guys still interested? There's something they do wrong. They build a brand new cart to put the ark on. Now, I want you to get this. The ark or the presence of God was never ever supposed to be carried by an, a, a cart or an animal. The instructions to hold the ark was, this is what it's supposed to be. It was, they were supposed to put two poles on each, on the rings, on the boxes, and these men or these priests or these holy men of God were supposed to carry the presence of God. Someone said, carry the presence of God. They're putting it on a cart. And so what, so, so now they have it on a cart and they get to this area that's a little rocky because, because they get it, the, the house that they get it at is uphill. They're coming downhill and they get to a little rocky area, which is a threshing floor where weed and, weed and shaft are, are separated. And it gets rocky. Now, one of the men that was walking with it, his name is Uzzah. What he does when, when, the, when, the, when the ark starts tipping, he tries to hold it. And when he holds it, he touches it, he dies on the spot. Now David is freaked out because he wanted to bring the presence of God to bless the nation. And now this guy just touches it and he's, he gets killed. But there were instructions that no one should touch the ark. There were instructions that it was supposed to be carried on the soldier, on the shoulders of holy men of God. You guys understand? I want you to get this. So they were treating the presence of God like they could just treat it however they wanted and it would just show up and it would be there. The presence of God did show up. It didn't show up the way they wanted it to show up. God was going to get them back on track. The message was, my presence and my power will be carried on the shoulders and the hearts of my people. When people want to experience God, they're going to have to come to my people because now my ark and my presence is in their hearts. We're going to end it with this. But it was a new cart. And, and I'm going to say this. I love the lights and I love this, this, this thing right here because you guys could read it. And it's so good and it's so effective, you don't even need a Bible anymore. I, I, I don't know if it's that good because you don't need a Bible anymore? No, we just look at the screen. I love the instruments. But you have to understand this, there's no new technology or no new method 
or new, new social values that will hold and carry the presence of God. I love all this stuff and we'll use it as a tool, but we cannot depend on things. We cannot depend on cards. We cannot depend on technology. The only thing that we can depend on is the presence of God and the presence of God shows up with some regular people like you and me. This is it. Are you going to come back tomorrow night? I tell you, it's going to get better. We got to get this. David finally gets it together. And what he does, he kind of gets freaked out with that guy dying, which I would too. Just imagine we have a church service and you do something wrong and then one of you guys die. I'd be like thinking, hey, man, there's something more dangerous than COVID, man. I don't know if we should open it up because somebody else might do that again. But it's just they weren't doing it right. You could do the right, the right thing the wrong way and still not get good results. You guys understand that? God had a message. So now this is it. David, David finally leaves. He, he has a goal to get the ark or the presence of God back in Jerusalem. And what he does after that guy dies, he gets freaked out, afraid, and angry. And what he does, he leaves it over a guy's house again. He leaves it at Obed's house. They're getting closer to the city, but it's almost going to end up, if we don't watch it, the same way, the same cycle is going to continue. But when they leave it over Obed's house, this is what the, for three months, they find out something. That Obed's house is blessed. His family's blessed. His finances are blessed. His health is blessed. And the news gets back to David and says, you know we left the ark in the presence of God over Abed's house and his house is more blessed than it's ever been blessed. As a matter of fact, everything that Obed has is now blessed. And it's because of the presence of God. When there's the presence of God in your home, when there's the presence of God in the church, when there's the presence of God in your business, when there's the presence of God in your marriage, your marriage and everything that's associated will be blessed. All you need is the presence of God. So David goes back. He goes, let's get this thing and let's bring it right back in the center Let's bring it out of obscurity and let's put it right back in the center of our city. Let's make the presence of God the thing. So what he does, he's so excited that David is now dancing. He is praising. Oh, boom, boom. He is shouting. They're bringing music. They're bringing, they're bringing instruments. They're singing out loud. David is dancing with a whole bunch of guys in the streets. He's king, but he's just dancing all kinds of crazy ways. He's expressing his praise. Come on. There's no quiet praise. This is a radical praise. He's jumping. He's shouting. And he's saying the presence of God is coming back. There's a miracle return of my presence. I just can't hold it. The word of God says, you can stand up if you want. Come on, stand up. The word of God says that his wife saw him dancing. And when she saw him dancing, she was more concerned with her image than she was with the presence of God. And she started looking at David dancing like a wild man. The scripture said he danced with all of his might. I don't know what that looks like, but it probably looks like a crumper. Are there any crumpers in the house? Is there a crumper? Is there a crumper here? Where's the crumper? And is there any crumpers or real crumpers? We used to have a ministry with crumpers. Come on, come up here. If you're not, you're not crump. You're not crump. 
I'm just watching you to think about this. David should be a man of dignity. He should be a, come on, he should, he should be actually, come on, he's a, he's a king. He should actually, he, he should be dignified. And he lost all his dignity because something was happening. The presence of God was coming back. It was returning. There was a miracle return. And the thing that was going to cause perpetual victory was going to be in the city. There we go, there we go. Whoa, come on, boom, 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 boom. Ha, 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 I need your power more than anything. So his wife said, you look like a fool, homie. <laughs> Distinguished king. I doubt it. You're dancing like a common person. You're a king. So after the big victory, the presence of God is back in the holies of holies. She is so jacked up. And I, I'm going to tell you this. Be careful on what side of praise you're on. Be careful that you're not on the critical side. They don't need to be doing all that. Don't you think they're overdoing it? Like that music is a little loud. And that girl that was singing, I don't know, man. I felt something, but I don't know what it is, though. And that pastor, crumpet? I don't think so. That's the devil. But you never used to say that at the club. You used to never used to say that when you were whacked out on drugs, talking to yourself. All of a sudden, when it comes to the presence of God, you got some weird dignity. Come on, is there anybody that's ready? Come on, to radically pray. God, let's break this thing. Let's break it. I defeat giants with this. Come on, I defeat the Philistines with this. I defeat the Juvencites with this. I defeat, come on, depression with this. I defeat addiction with this. I defeat, come on, every single enemy that comes my way with this. We have, we, we have no problem someone dancing when they hit the game winning home run and they're dancing around the bases. That's right. That's right. But when it comes to church, somehow we got a problem with it. And you know what God's saying? I don't got a problem with it. Because what I did for you is more important than a home run. What I did for you is more than winning a game. Come on, I sent my best for you, for you can have my presence. I died for you. I resurrected from the dead so you can live with me forever and ever and ever. And whatever you're facing, I give you victory over it. One more praise to God. One more praise to God. We praise you. We worship you with all our might.
I want you to get this. We got to be careful because you don't want to become emotional. And the, the other side, you don't want to become dead. So I got to play it in the middle, Pastor. It's okay to express your emotion before God. Come on. It's okay to express your joy before God. It's okay for you to be grateful for what God has done and he's going to do. One more praise. Go ahead. One more. You know what we're doing? We're getting ready for perpetual victory. We're getting ready, come on, for no weapon formed against us shall prosper. We're getting ready for mighty revelation. We're getting ready to, come on, expand the kingdom. Expand, come on. We're getting ready for that. But everything begins with the presence of God and a group of people that value the presence of God so much that they celebrate it, that they praise God for it. Now, church, I'm going to say something. Let's never go back to ho-hum praise. <laughs> Amen. When people come into this room, they should feel the electric power of the spirit. They should feel fire because you're full of fire. There's a time that you got to let go and just shake something off. Like right now I'm discouraged and you got to say I messed up last night. But thank God that even if you messed up last night, God says if you confess your sins, God will forgive you and cleanse you. Stop living in your past and start celebrating the forgiveness and start worshiping God. He forgave you. Come on. It's okay to praise God and thank him because he's been so good. Now, God's good. I, this is like a Holy Ghost party. Don't stop. All right. Church, tomorrow night, we're beginning a process. We're laying foundation. And there's so much more I could talk about the presence of God, but we're laying foundation. But the one thing that me and you need is the presence of God back in our families. Demons are not scared of your intellect. They're not intimidated by your physical strength. And I know you work out a lot. And I know you got around 3 or 4% body fat, but that means nothing in the spirit. You look good without a shirt. I understand that. And you probably get a lot of likes on Facebook and Instagram. But it don't do nothing in the spirit. When you got a marriage problem. When you're being tormented in your mind. When you can't sleep at night. When you're heartbroken. When there's darkness has taken over your life and depression. And thoughts of ki killing yourself and quitting. Throwing in a towel. You need the presence of God, church. And I never, church, I never want to get to the point that I'll ever sacrifice the presence of God for more people in the seats. My, Michael, which is Michael, which was David's wife, she was in disgust with his praise. Never get to the point that you're turned off and offended by someone being excited about God. Instead of like, instead of like, say, hey, you know, 
saying, that's not for me. Maybe you need to turn the page and say, wow, what have they got? I'd like to have some of that. It looks a little crazy, but I need to crump my way out of this thing. Okay. <laughs> crazy. But this is what I want. If you said, Pastor, and I want, if you're here for the first time, I, I spoke with passion because I want you to know this one thing that God is real. He could really change your life. He could fix what you can't fix. He can turn it around. You know, when I, when I saw Brian up here, when Brian came to our church, he was an atheist. Eight years later, he's a pastor of our youth. God did what no one could do. When I look at my son-in-law, Gabriel, he married my daughter. He came to this church as a career gang member. And his parents are part of, his dad's part of the Mexican mafia. His brother's in prison for murder. And Gabriel's goal was to go to prison. He couldn't wait. He was doing things to go to prison. He comes to our church in a service like this, a little crazy, but he needed a real breakthrough. And he came forward. And we're talking about from tagger, criminal, drug dealer, drug addict, to, come on, to a pastor in the way we're all outreach, how to happen, the presence of God. Come up here. How old are you? 11 years old. He's cut. She's coming up here for prayer. She needs, she needs power. But I'll tell you why. She's dealing with real demons at 11 years old. Demons don't care if you're 11. Because you got a mind and you got a soul and the devil wants it. What's your name? Andrea. Andrea, okay. Andrea, we love you, honey. Okay. And you feel the presence of God. She's crying right now. The presence of God is hitting her. Okay. Mama, what, is, what does Andrea need prayer for? Dealing with depression and suicide thoughts. Okay. Okay. We're going to help you, baby. You know what we did? We just shame the devil, saying, you're not going to do that to Andrea. She's ours. Okay? Are you ready, mama? Do you want a breakthrough in your life? Do you want to get set free from depression and suicidal thoughts? Come on, church. This is why we need real praise. These are real issues. Okay. If you're out there, come on. We're not playing church anymore. Come on. We got to get ready, even in our praise and worship. We can't even start preaching until the presence of God starts hitting this place. Then we preach when the, pre when the temperature is right. If you're saying, Pastor, that's me. I need the presence of God in my life. You get that by placing your faith in Jesus. The Bible says when you repent and you believe in Christ, this is what God gives you. His spirit, his power comes into your heart, into your life. It's real. If you're in this room, I want you to understand this. Jesus is knocking at your heart's door. The presence of God wants to enter. Are you going to be like Michelle, Michael, his wife that says, nah, I don't want that. You know what happened to her? She became unfruitful and barren the rest of her life. Because a person that doesn't have a relationship with God cannot produce the joy of the Lord, the peace of God, or eternal life. Only God could do that. But if you say, Pastor, that's me. I need the presence of God. I need joy in my life. I need eternal life. I need a breakthrough. What I want you to do is leave your seat, and I want you to come up here. You got to be like David. You got to radically, I want to leave my addiction there. I want to leave my pain there. I want to leave my past there. I want a new beginning. This is what happens. You got to make a decision. 
Come on, let's come up as you say, that's me. I need the presence of God in my life. I need a breakthrough in my life. Tonight's the night. Come on, leave your depression there. Leave your fear there. Leave your past there. There's also some Christians out there Come on. that you've been serving God, but you haven't felt the presence of God for a really long time. Say, so, man, I need a breakthrough right now. I feel overwhelmed. I can't think straight. I've been confused. Tonight's your night of your breakthrough. But this is what you're going to have to do. It's going to have to step out and make that sacrifice who cares what people think? Get your breakthrough tonight. Okay. Anybody else? And I want to ask one more question. If today were your last day on earth, do you know where you spend eternity? That's real. After you breathe your last breath on this earth, you're going to wake up in front of God. Jesus Christ. And those that receive Christ have eternal life. Those that have not received Christ will be lost for eternity. In a real hell, this real. Some people tell me, Marco, this, work, this life on earth is hell. And I'm telling you, without God, it is living hell. But it's not hell. Eternity separated from God, your family, all your friends. This is your moment. Jesus is knocking on your heart's door. He wants to forgive you of your sins, and he wants to give you eternal life. He wants to give you the abundant life you've been looking for. Tonight's your night. Anybody else? I want to make sure. Say, Pastor, that's me. I'm not sure I'm right with God, but I want to get right with God. Ask your neighbor. You want to go up there, I'll go up there with you. I just don't want to miss anybody. This is your night. This is your breakthrough. All you need is the presence of God to turn those losses into wins. All right. We're going to pray, church. Come on, church. Let's give the Lord a hand for everyone that came up here ready. Are you ready? Okay. Are you guys ready? Everybody ready? Are you ready to surrender everything to the Lord? Are you ready to be crazy for Jesus? Like all out? You ready? He's crazy for you. Surrender it all. It's your moment. He's the only one that can set you free. He's the only one to give you eternal life. He's the only one that can break it. Okay. Let's pray together. Bow your heads, close your eyes, repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I believe that you love me so much. You died on the cross for my sins so that I could be forgiven. Forgive me. Set me free. I open my heart and I ask you, Jesus, come in and be the Lord of my life. Fill me now with your power, with your presence, with your freedom, with your joy. And I command every spirit of torment, of suicide, depression, addiction, confusion, leave now in the name of Jesus. I have victory now. Fill me now, Lord with your power from this day forward I will follow you for the rest of my life in Jesus name I pray amen let's give the Lord one more big hand go on let's give the Lord one more big hand he's a good guy church you do not want to miss tomorrow night tonight we got a major key the presence of God tomorrow night we're going to get another major key to our assignment to do what God has called us to do. Get ready. Take the presence of God with you at home. Worship God. Get ready tomorrow for breakthrough. If you need prayer coming up, we'd love to pray with you. We're here for your service. <laughs>